The following podcast contains spoilers and words like cr- and gosh d- Mate, did we watch a thing this week? Yeah, we did. Hello everyone and welcome back to We Watched A Thing. You've got Billy and this week I'm joined by a very special guest. I'm lucky enough to have on the show great friend Paul from the Countdown Movie and TV Reviews podcast. Topher is still listening to the soothing sounds of a 12-week-old baby and enjoying <laughs> that. <laughs> How you doing, Paul? I'm good. Thank you for having me, Billy. And I'm just going to channel... I know you're not supposed to just sort of fill in and try and you know, occupy the role of a co-host, but I've long... Long respected Topher for being a harsher and harder critic than I am. So, um, all right, here we go. Hey, 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 got it. <laughs> Topher, ready to go. Mate, feel free to channel Topher all you want. If you want to just randomly blurt out how shit Tommy Boy is, go ahead and I'll tell well, you. Well, you brought it up right before off. I could. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great. To side have hard with Topher there. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sure listeners of our show, I'm sure have, have listened to you before. I've been a long time fan of yours. We've, we've been lucky to guest on your show before, but this is the first time. You, in fact, yeah. I mean, listen. Listeners will know we don't often have guests. Sam is is lucky to have been here twice. So, um, yeah, very happy <laughs> when you were too. able to join me today. Um, well, thank you for the invitation, especially to do this kind of film, which is uh, kind of up my alley. Yes, well, and I figured you you probably wouldn't be doing this on on your show because I didn't think mm-hmm. Wayne would have a bar of it. No, but, correct, hundred percent. Yes, today we're going to be talking about the Empty Man which are the 2020 American supernatural horror thriller film written, directed, and edited by David Pryor based on the Cullen Bunn and Vanessa Ardell Ray's graphic novel of the same name. It stars James Badge Dale, Marin Island, Stephen Root, Ron Canada, Robert Arameo, Joel Courtney, and Sasha Frolova. And I'm going to make you do this. What's it about, Paul? Oh, here we go. <laughs> uh, basically, it is about a sort of mythical figure which... Uh, called The Empty Man, which once you, of course, blow on a, on an empty bottle or a wind chime over a bridge, uh, on the first night you'll hear it, I guess him, on the second night you'll see him, and then on the third night he comes for you. So, it's this kind of Candyman-esque urban legend, which then takes a couple of hard right turns uh, through the course of this incredibly long 137-minute <laughs> film. Yes. I found this film very, very, very long. I was happy to to be in the cinema. That like I, I'm happy yes. to sit in a cinema for hours. I could I've famously done like you know back to back viewings for a full day and loved it. But I don't. Yeah, this film was far too long for me. Hundred percent agree with you. I I couldn't believe when this film has a twenty one minute prologue and then the opening or well, the the title card appears and I'm like. Wow, they really are settling in for the long haul here. I was very pleased that I chose to see this in a in a gold class cinema. I had food coming to me, had a couple of drinks. It made the experience more palatable. But I totally agree with you. To be in a cinema again is just wonderful. Yeah. So you you famously are a huge horror fan, even more than I am. I know that you're a big horror watcher. So I was guessing this was always on your radar. Well, can I can I say I had not heard of this film at all. I think I saw it opening night, Thursday night in Australia. I hadn't heard of it until the Saturday preceding it. Not even a whiff or a whimper about it. I was wandering through YouTube doing the YouTube rabbit hole thing and stumbled across a trailer for this film. And then it said opening at the end of the week. And I'm like, oh, okay. Well, it doesn't look too terrible. I saw one review, which of course is the only positive review that exists for this film, <laughs> and I thought, "All right, good enough. Let's let's make that make a night of this." And it, so that it, I guess that was kind of a novelty. It really took me by surprise that I had never heard anything about this film because normally, as you say, I'm all over these horror films. Yeah, this has to be Disney's least marketed film of all time for sure. Um, and I feel like really they didn't have a lot of faith in this film. I don't know if you stayed no. till the end credits. It still has copyright 2018. At the end. I didn't realise that this film has been sitting on the shelf for that long. More than that, it has the 20th Century Fox logo yes. at the start. <laughs> yes, they a studio which no longer exists. exists. They couldn't even be bothered. Uh, Disney, oh, nah, don't worry, we won't, we won't change it to 20th Century Studios. Who cares? It's just the empty man. I know, it shows yeah. you all the faith that they had in this movie. That's right. No one's going to see it because it may as well have been called The Empty Cinema. <laughs> uh, which I'm <laughs> sure is a have- joke that's been made by a million people already. <laughs> Well, no, because not a million people have seen this movie. Oh, well, yeah. Um, <laughs> but how many people were in your cinema when you saw it? Did you have an individual count? Uh, I was there. So, yeah, if you went the opening night, which would have been Thursday, I went on the Saturday night. 
Oh, uh, I tell a lie. I was Friday night. I saw it. My apology. Right. There you go. So, I saw it on the Saturday night and there were four other people in the cinema. <laughs> Uh, I had I had four others as well, so it was <laughs> yeah. five of us in our cinema. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, I, I feel like maybe this film is marketed a little bit wrong. I haven't seen the trailer because I don't watch trailers, but I would not call this a horror. To me, this is more of a suspense detective thriller, if anything. Well, it's, yeah, it's interesting. It's got a horror premise, but becomes almost a detective procedural, not quite a police procedural, because the main character, played by James Badge Dale, who I like. I like him in just about everything I've seen him in, so that probably helped the film a lot for me. I think what he gets to do in this film, he does pretty well. Yeah, uh, he's a he's a he's a stand up character actor who's somehow got the lead in this particular film. So I didn't mind following him, but then it went on and on and on, and and ultimately with what's revealed by the end of the film kind of doesn't make a whole heap of sense why we had to go through all that. Yeah, it gets very messy towards the end. I feel like I'm kind of bearing a little bit here. I actually didn't hate this film. I was somewhere in the middle. I actually think that there's plenty of this film to like. I think it's extremely competently put together. I agree. James Badge Dale is quite engaging to watch and I wouldn't mind seeing him in this kind of role in in a in a different neater film, I think. Um, I loved the cameo by Stephen Root because Stephen Root is always fantastic. For me, that's about where the cast ends. I think some of the other performances are a little bit not great. Um, but I actually yeah, quite I like the style of the film. I think it gives a kind of eerie presence. It's never scary per se, but I think the score, the cinematography, the visuals overall are, are quite competently put together. Yeah, I would agree. It's got director David Price, his first feature film, apparently worked quite closely with Fincher and did a couple of making of, of his films. And it, This has a real Fincher vibe to it in terms of the drab, yeah, dreary sure. kind of grey, dark tones of, of the film, not just thematically, but in terms of visually. And so, that all worked for me. And I think the score is really good as well. Uh, Christopher Young Lustmore did the music. And I, it felt really appropriate and sort of puts you on the edge a little bit, at least as long as it can before it goes for too long, asking you to stay on the edge. So, the biggest problem here for me is is the script. It doesn't really know what it wants to be it seems like a very strange adaptation of this of this graphic novel which apparently is very different yeah i agree for me i think that there's a lot to clean up here the prologue should be lost entirely for my mind which is a shame because in some ways it's one of the most effective quote-unquote horror scenes in the film i think Mm -hmm. after this it very much becomes more as you say procedural but I just don't think it needs to be there. For for the length, it doesn't make you care about the characters in that scene, and nor should it, because you just don't need to. And it really gives you nothing extra about the stories that unfolds, I don't think. any Anything more than when you see about the incident in the newspaper later on in the film, that's all we needed. I don't think we need this prologue here at all. Yeah, it almost... If that was the thing you're going to cut, I think this whole film would change entirely, because as you say, it's probably the closest thing to straight horror that this film gets. But then there's a, a reveal later in the film that ties back into the prologue, which would lose all its power. So, you'd have to completely change the way that was all put together. That's a good 10, 15, 20 minutes worth of, of screen time as well. I'm not saying it's a bad idea at all that this film should be 40 minutes shorter. There should be a yeah. 100-minute horror film tops, uh, given where it ends up. But but I totally get what you're saying, that the feeling is, and that the trailer was, this is kind of, I thought it was going to be a very bloodthirsty a uh, violent film about basically dumb kids l- challenging this empty man slash doing the thing a la Candyman. And then James Badge Dale's character gets involved investigating the disappearance of his neighbor's da- uh, daughter. And he was going to stumble across what this whole thing was, which he does, but not in the way that you think. So, after that, the police or detective procedural stuff, then it turns into a cult film and not a very particularly good cult film either. So, uh, I d- this film just didn't know what it wanted to be. Yeah, that's my problem too, because I actually I do quite like James Badge Dale, and I didn't mind the detective-y type stuff. Even the cult stuff, right up until there's actually one quite good scene in the film where he's at the camp and he sees the big yeah. bonfire. That's a great sequence there where he takes the one step back, and then you just hear that whole cult take one step forward. Um <laughs> Yeah, to- nah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to me though, everything from that scene onwards just gets so up its ass with the culty stuff that it kind of every moment of story that has led up to that, I feel like just becomes pointless because now we're just a cult film. Exactly. And it almost like well, all right. And then I get a bit confused, and maybe you can help me out here, Billy, if I'm really honest. 
the film says, in the end, James Badgedale's character, um, James, he's been basically created to be this vessel for this messenger of evil, this empty man thing. So, then the yeah. title is almost, you know, has a dual meaning now. It's the empty man is the thing, but it's also he is meant to be an empty man this thing will occupy. Yeah. Oh, I'm right so far, right? Yeah. I like yeah. that reveal. That that really caught me by surprise. I didn't see that. But, of course, in a cult film, it doesn't ever end well. The cult never gets taken down and, and taken to justice. The moment it becomes a cult film, everybody that you care about in this film is going to die or be a member of the cult. So... Of course, that's what happens, and therefore I lost all interest in a way at that point. As much as I enjoy, generally speaking, the, the weirdness about cults, um, not in real life, I should add. <laughs> <laughs> but so we got this Lovecrafting kind of evil on the edges of whatever it is, space and time or the dimension that's kind of wanting to come through this cult that's trying to bring it through, and we've got this guy they've created for the purpose of this. Why did they let this guy run around and have experiences then? Yeah, that's what I don't understand either. I'm I'm exactly with you there. And I think their explanation is that, and this, I didn't fully really get the reason, but it's the same reason they gave him memories is that they needed him to feel to be empty. They needed him to experience pain was basically their explanation, which is why they gave him memories of losing his son which I guess is the same reason they let him run around. But no, I'm I'm exactly with you there. Is To me, that just did not add up at all. <laughs> it doesn't because in the film, he goes to investigate, as you said, the effective uh, camp scene and all these cultists chase him. And now they're, they're throwing themselves at the car when he gets in there, mm. really having a go. I'm like, if they actually caught him, what would they have done? Yeah, that's the thing. They're not going to kill him. <laughs> they no. created him. <laughs> which would have stopped the whole, which would have crea- destroyed the illusion for him at that point in time. Like when they grabbed him and just all went, ah, oh, okay, let him, what, let him go? Yeah. Escorted him back to Stephen Root's character. Like why not? If you're going to give him, and I get it, he needs to feel pain for whatever reason in this particular universe for this entity to come through him. Well, why not just keep him in a room with those memories they've created for him and let him suffer like that where it's all safe and they've got control of what's going on? Yeah, that's exactly my thoughts too. If they've given him, you know, however long, 40 odd years of memories, why does he need to live a single day at all? <laughs> no, it's, it's uh, very, very strange. Yeah. I, and this is another problem I have with the film is I don't like when things are just completely illogical. To me, the entire premise of the oh, film yeah. kind of falls apart early on. So- my understanding is that in the comics, the empty man, and they allude to this in the screenplay where they say it's almost like a plague, like a virus that yes. spreads. That doesn't actually happen in the film. It seems to only affect those who go through this ritual where they pick up the bottle, they blow it, the most convoluted ritual of all time, mm. where you have to do like a million things in the right order at the right time, which even that doesn't add up because part of the ritual is it has to be after dark. He doesn't do it after dark and it still works. Oh, yeah. yeah. And also, I don't believe at the start of the film, the guy who does it at the start is doing it after dark either. No, he just that's, falls that's down right. this chasm and yeah. then just blows on this stupid horn and, <laughs> and he's, he's the, the empty man. That's right. But to me, it's like, okay, so just don't blow in the bottle and everything's fine. It's only affecting people who do that. Just just don't do that and you're fine, mate. The movie's over. And even that was convoluted. So, okay, the daughter of the neighbor was recruited to, I can't remember the name of the, of the cult first. And then so she just got her friends to all do it somehow. But it wasn't yeah. her suggestion. Oh, was, she, was it her suggestion? It, it was, was her suggestion. Yeah, it was. Yeah. But it was a story that they all knew about. So, I, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. <laughs> and then they some people kill themselves, but then other people are killed by the empty man. So, I didn't get it. Like, the whole bunch of those kids, they all just uh, hang themselves underneath the bridge. Yeah. But, but then the other girl who doesn't gets murdered by the empty man on the third day, I guess. Well, she does, although I... Th- I don't know. Oh, that show her stabbing herself. That's yet. right. You see the empty man attacking her with scissors, but then it cuts to her doing it herself. So I guess the implication mm. is that uh, I don't know. The empty man is like a visualization. I'd love to know how he got everyone to hang themselves at the same time. Then that's some real power. <laughs> yeah, that is real power. On the empty man himself, I did not like the look of the empty man. I think that mm. to me is where the visuals fall apart. You brought up that the director has worked with Fincher before, and I think you can clearly see that. There's a lot of inspiration in like the police procedural stuff. The supernatural elements for me fall apart right from the start. I don't love when cameras shake and I don't mm. love the glitch look, which happens quite a bit in this film. Mm, I hear you. Yeah. Loud and clear. And the empty man himself, I think, I don't mind the idea of like basically just a walking cloak, which is kind of what he looks like, but I just don't think it's realized exceptionally well in the film. Nope. I'm right there with you. 
it's, it's so unmemorable other than he's this sort of blurish thing with a cloak that I can't even remember what his face is. Yeah. Or what, yeah. what mask he's wearing. Is it like a skeleton skull I type thing? I actually couldn't tell you either. Yeah. I feel Which, like it was- Whoops. Like an, I feel like he was wearing like a like a snow jacket with the hood being empty, like just blackness. But maybe he did have a face. I honestly can't even recall. That's how good this movie is. <laughs> to, me, to me, it's almost been supplanted by the typical image of the Grim Reaper. So- yeah. yeah. Sorry, Phil. Great review this one, Billy. We're the best. <laughs> so good. <laughs> I wish I could say more positive things about it, but really how you go from, like you said, this plague source material, and I get it, that's on the nose in this time, but this was filmed well before COVID. Yeah. It was finished, as you say, in 2018. I think it was shot in 2017. And obviously, they knew they had a bit of a stinker on their hands because they just sat on it until now and they've just dumped it into theatres where it's made a whole 2.6 million around the world to this point in time. Yeah, including which we have a, we've contributed a significant amount of money to that total. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just I know that people are going to look at this. Obviously, you have your hardcore listeners who will listen and your regulars, and they'll go, oh, "Okay, I'm not watching that movie." But I just think everyone's going to go, what the hell is that movie? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's this movie's not going to light anything on fire. <laughs> And as you say, this is, we're desperate now for content. Like, I think we're really starting to get this sense now of movie theatres. Like, they're open here for us in, in our states in Australia and hopefully around the rest of Australia very shortly. The rest of the world, clearly not so fortunate at the moment. But there's just nothing coming there that's really interesting or entertaining. No, that's so, right. Yeah. The best thing I I've seen in cinemas since they reopened is going to see Empire Strikes Back and Return of the oh. Jedi because they're just reshowing classics. And that's that's honestly the best thing that is offering in cinemas at the moment. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if there's a couple of things on the horizon. I don't know whether they really will release, what do you call it, Wonder Woman at Christmas time. I, I doubt it, to be honest. I think yeah. they'll push that again. But I guess we've got some some quirky different things like Fat Man coming, which I'll go to the cinema to see. That looks like fun. But if this is the best that we've got left- I guess my point is we're in a bit of a content drought now and even then this film can't get over the line to be decent when I'm when everything by comparison is pretty poor it's not a great not a great sign at all that's what I've got to say yeah yeah I know when the best thing about seeing this movie is just like eating popcorn and chicken tendies and having a beer in a oh. dark room with that's four it. other people <laughs> you know I had myself I had myself a chocolate sundae. That was by far the highlight of this movie. <laughs> uh, and, I know, and I'm really sad that this is the film we wound up with because, you know, you, you, you and Sam got to go at each other for 35 minutes about Ubi Halloween. Uh, maybe we should spend the next 10 minutes just talking about uh, our difference of opinion about Tommy Boy. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to do that, to be honest, because Tommy Boy fucking rocks. And I will happily label this episode The Empty Man slash Tommy slash Boy. Slash Tommy Boy part two. <laughs> Tommy Boy redux. There you go. Now, I, I did make you watch Tommy Boy as a patron of your show. Yep. and uh, No, not thank you. Thank you for being a patron. Not thank you for that choice. And, and you and Wayne- both slammed it. Wayne slammed a comedy, Billy. <laughs> Tommy Boy is one of the greatest movies ever made, Paul. That's all I'm going to say on that. I heard you say to Sam that it was in your top 40 odd or 50 films of all time. Favorite. That's right. Of all yeah. Because I'm working on that list for you. Yes. And we're, we're it's, um, yeah, I've, uh, I'm still rearranging the list and it's, I'm not going to lie. I've shocked myself with some of the things that creep into the list. But I, yeah. I'm just now bringing up the uh, list of what number you've got because uh, I hope it's not going to be the 10 that we talk about live. <laughs> no, it won't. I, I think I'm doing 20 to 10. And I did that so that I, so that I didn't have to perfect my entire list. <laughs> but that said, we are looking at doing everyone's 100 together and pulling it and then announcing yeah. the independent podcasters <laughs> of Australia slash New Zealand slash the US uh, of a... Uh, independent podcasting and favourite films of all time awards or something like that. I haven't got there, obviously, yet. But <laughs> the fact that Tommy Boy, I'm pretty confident, is not going to be on that list when we combine all of ours together. Are you telling me you didn't laugh once? Uh, I may have. I do remember saying to Wayne the last couple of times, uh, very early on, but not at any point where I was meant to be laughing, <laughs> basically. I was mostly laughing at the film, not with it. Well, okay. So, what you're saying is you hate fat people. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I really hate David Spade. <laughs> if we had to pin it right down, he's the guy I hate most in these films. That said, you know, the King of B in a film will always get a, a slight score, but I just, 
it's a, I guess it's a nostalgia thing for you. I heard you, you slate Billy Madison the other day. I'd watch Billy Madison 20 times more before I watched Tommy Boy once more again. Oh, man. Like, I, lo- I loved Billy Madison as a kid, but that movie doesn't hold up. No, I 100% agree. Neither does Tommy Boy, Billy. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't hold up at all. <laughs> You need to. I can't wait until you get to like your top ten favorite films so that I can shit on them. Which actually I did recently. You have started. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) How dare you, sir? Six out of ten for Predator. I was. I mean, our patrons will know that uh, we had to record our own specific reply to that. We were so incensed. Well, I was so incensed. One was like, "Yeah, sure, I'll do it." (laughs) I know. I can't believe how generous I was being there with a six out of (laughs) ten. I, sh- I should retrospectively take my my. I think I gave Tommy Boy like twenty two out of a hundred. Yep. I should knock it down to like fourteen, so it becomes a half a star film. <laughs> well, that would just make me cry. No, I, so I don't we, want to do that. We don't want to do that. I'm not really Topher. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Well, I, I think we're I think we're done here. To be honest, I oh, know. I'm sorry. It's been, a, it's been a great lengthy conversation about <laughs> the Empty Man. Really, it's the empty episode. <laughs> Do you think there's any chance at all anyone's going to remember this movie ever came out about five to six years from now, unless you're looking back through your letterboxed recounting of things? I don't think there's a chance at all. No, I, d- I don't think that this movie will be remembered even by James Badge Dale. <laughs> <laughs> I think in like 20 years, he'll be scrolling through his own to being like, oh, yeah, I used to act. And then he'll see this and he'll be like, oh, what the fuck is that? <laughs> I might, I might watch it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You'll be very disappointed. <laughs> I wonder if he's, uh, I mean, obviously he didn't get paid this much, but uh, if we pull a bit of a, a Michael Caine with regard to uh, Jaws of Revenge, I've never seen The Empty Man, <laughs> yeah. but I have seen the very nice car that it bought in my driveway and drove yeah. for the next 10 years. <laughs> All right. So, how are you scoring this? Uh, I feel like I've almost talked it down during our conversation. So, do we go halves? Are we allowed to go half or not? Oh, you can go a half if you want. We can do whatever we want. <laughs> we can do whatever we want. I'll give it four and a half out of ten. Yeah. I, uh, I'm i with you. I did have a five listed, but yeah, I feel like I've talked myself down. I'm going to go a four. Why not? Yeah. I'm okay. I'm totally okay with that. I did give it five as I walked out of the theatre, but uh, reflecting on it for the 15 or so minutes that I remembered what I watched, uh, I wasn't as impressed a couple of days later as not impressed, but walked out of there going, ah, it was okay. Yeah, the not, extra point so was much. definitely for the Sunday. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah. That's gone now, long gone. <laughs> <laughs> All right, why don't you tell our listeners how they can find you and Wayne? <laughs> well, you can Google the Countdown Movie and TV Reviews and you'll find pretty much links to, to most of our stuff there. But if you want to hit us up specifically for a conversation, uh, Twitter, on Twitter, I should say, at the Countdown PC. And we have a Facebook listener community on on Facebook as well, where you can uh, search that and join along in the conversations where B Dizzle here often contributes. So thank you, Billy. No worries. In the meantime, if you want to get in touch with us, you can do that at wewatchthething.com or wewatchthething at gmail.com. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, all under the handle at wewatchthething. If you want to help support the show, you can do that at patreon.com forward slash wewatchthething. And I'll catch you next week. So yeah.